people looking at a technology in that state, they'll, you know, they know that they need to do something with Kubernetes, but not everybody has yet figured out what exactly it is and how it fits into the portfolio of modern operations. Hi, this is Sonil Bharti and we are here at KubeCon in San Diego and today we have with us Julian Fisher. You are CEO of any Nines. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for being on the show. Uh, I'm curious, can you explain what does any Nines do in context of Kubernetes? So in general, we provide building blocks to build modern application platforms and subsequently there's no way around Kubernetes these days. So coming from a Cloud Foundry background, We've um, helped many customers to adopt Cloud Foundry. Um, we've completed platforms with data service automation. And now customers are asking, what is um, the path to adopt Kubernetes? And therefore, we help to bridge the gap. We're also addressing the Kubernetes audience directly with a set of products and help them to solve how to operate workloads at scale. So it's basically carrying out the same mission, just a part of the technology stack is about to change. Uh, if you look at KubeCon, the event is growing, which also reflects the growth and adoption of Kubernetes itself. It's more or less like a hammer and you're just looking a nail to hit on, you know. And, um, with this, this growth of adoption, uh, there are a lot of challenges also coming up, you know. Uh, it could be scalability, this could be security. So from your perspective, what are the challenges that you see? Because you see a lot of use cases that, you know, even the Kubernetes community did not think of as the use case. That's true. Uh, so Kubernetes is one of the technologies being in the hype cycle. So there's a lot of attention. People looking at a technology in that state, they'll, you know, they know that they need to do something with Kubernetes, but not everybody has yet figured out what exactly it is and how it fits into the portfolio of modern operations. So you'll see, I mean, definitely the operation of applications is one of the uh, use cases. But for example, there's uh, also a trend of storing data in Kubernetes clusters where uh, operators are being created to automate data service workloads in Kubernetes as well. And this is one of the examples where a hype cycle um, leads to a development in uh, technology that subsequently may cause some problems that then need to be resolved. In the example of data services, for example, we have a missing isolation for I.O. and network, uh, for network and disk I.O. performance, which you have with uh, para-virtualized virtual machines. So the, the thing is that if you bring your data workloads on Kubernetes, you have to solve that by, for example, telling the scheduler uh, to isolate a database node on a Kubernetes node and not mix it with another database node where bad neighborhood issues could occur. So this is just one of the trends that you can see where certain problems may arise, at least if it's done at scale. And well, at the same time, you see that uh, the idea of service meshes is currently evolving, getting a lot of attention. So in particular, the sidecar pattern is very popular. So when you describe an application, you can use toolings that will then add a functionality to the application, but you'll specify uh, what exactly this is going to be rather than to put it into the application. So one of the patterns, that, for example, that's very popular is A-B testing, where you need to split incoming requests into two categories and distribute it to two versions of your application. So Sidecar uh, pattern allows you to have processes in a pod, in a separate container that will act as a reverse proxy and then split the traffic to two different versions of your application or carrying out a policy, a security policy. So that a lot of is evolving around that pattern currently. It could be something like traffic shaping, A-B testing, or it could be a, a general policy engine that would be co-located. So if you go into the um, Cloud Native Foundation, you will also see many projects uh, around that. Also traceability, logging metrics, well, a lot of them use that sidecar pattern. And another thing that is happening with this growth is uh, there are so many projects that are coming up. So they had to create a sandbox so that new projects can come in. Some of these projects overlap uh, the functionality of each other. At the same time, there are a lot of gaps also. So uh, 
what do you look at these two problems, overlapping projects at the time of somebody comes in to fill those gaps? Well, it's actually a very exciting aspect. Uh, when I see all those different technologies pop up, um, it, it also becomes clear what Kubernetes is not. Kubernetes is not a solution. It is basically a framework to build platforms. So many components are contributed by third parties who try to you know, either commercialize that or use that as marketing, um, competing to uh, actually conquer a certain niche of um, building platforms with Kubernetes. So the more, let's say, um, policy engines there are, uh, the question is how many of them will survive in the long term. So one of the things I, I try doing when I walk from booth to booth is ask them, how are you funded? Are you profitable? And I'd be interesting, it would be interesting to see how many of these companies will have a sustainable business model in the end. So because if, if you are a large corporate, well, you're looking for a solution that works for your application developers. Do you really want to dig into the details and pick each individual piece and putting that together? Because that requires a lot of system knowledge, whereas a solution provider usually gives you a platform that will work out of the box where all these decisions have been made. So what I currently see is that a lot of companies build small building blocks where the large uh, system providers, they come with solutions. So I'm very interesting to see whether there will be that market where all those little building blocks will be bought or whether a large piece of the cake goes to the infrastructure providers and another large piece goes to the to these large system integrators. And we'll, we'll see about that. Where does any ninth come into you know, these, the, the whole ecosystem of providers? Well, one of the things that we actually achieve is we take existing building blocks uh, from the open source community and we provide and wrap them uh, with automation so make it consumable for the enterprise. Well, this results into a cost-effective framework to build such a platform. So if a customer comes to us and says, well, we want to have a contemporary solution for running applications, we'll give them the building blocks they need. This includes a Cloud Foundry if they have a lot of factor compliant applications, Kubernetes as well, as a set of eight data services, or the commonly used ones. And they can either uh, buy that as individual uh, tested pieces of software to download and set up in their AWS account or even on-premises, and optionally they can book a fully managed service. So they can either tailor down to the bits and pieces and select those they actually they are missing in their own application uh, platform, or they can just take a solution approach uh, fully managed. So it's the two ends of the spectrum, and people can choose. Earlier you were ta talking about, uh, it was a kind of classic example of build versus buy, either you can take open source code. Uh, does it, like the, the open source project on which the product is based, does it also help in companies or users uh, kind of playing, toying with their project to see how it works or how they can integrate it and then they move to commercial? Or there are two different words that project is meant only for uh, collaboration? Well, generally what I see is two different ways how digital transformation works. It's like, um, you know those pocket uh, heaters that you can actually light on one end or two ends? So sometimes a company is uh, approaching the digital transformation top down, which would be one end. Sometimes it's uh, bottom-up where developers actually ask their managers to adopt new technologies to gain more productivity. And in some companies, both is happening at the same time. So, for example, a top-down uh, approach, which is one of the patterns you see in Cloud Foundry very much, because Cloud Foundry is quite heavyweight. So there are a lot of components. You need to dedicate a lot of infrastructures. You need to convince managers to spend a certain amount of money to get a Cloud Foundry. Whereas Kubernetes is much smaller you need less infrastructure resources, um, less invest in total. So it can be actually decided locally in a development department. And what you can see over time is the following. You'll have large accounts with large cloud foundries, and you have large customers with many isolated Kubernetes clusters. So that's very different in those two ecosystems. If uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem seems to be um, very attractive for developers, 
where the Cloud Foundry ecosystem was very much in, um, targeting uh, the CIO level, at least. So there, was, there was no not the same adoption uh, from developers as with Kubernetes. And the reason for that is also quite clear. So download and set up Cloud Foundry requires uh, a certain motivation to overcome that barrier of entry in both learning the technology, such as Bosch, the automation technology favored by Cloud Foundry, as well as dedicating enough infrastructure resources, which can easily go into the thousands a month. Now, with Kubernetes, that's much easier. Like it's easy to consume. You can have a mini version on your local laptop. So when you come home as a developer, it's easy to set up such a box and you know, start playing around because it's well documented. You can also have a, a very fast learning curve and have your rewards quickly. So this drives a developer adoption much more than Cloud Foundry did. Although you have to say that if, if I were to choose to run, let's say, 3,000 applications today, I would still prefer Cloud Foundry because it's proven, it works at scale, and it's hassle-free for the developers. Whereas, whereas with Kubernetes, you still have to make a lot more choices to take a vanilla Kubernetes and turn it into something that targets application developers efficiently. Uh, before we started this regarding this interview, we were talking about that uh, these two technologies, not these, sometimes a lot of technologies, they, they overlap, overstep on each other's toes. So what is the situation because you operate in Cloud Foundry world and Kubernetes world? Do you see similar overlapping happening there? And if you do, uh, what is the right uh, solution for customers? Well, I would say that uh, Cloud Foundry, as I said, is a proven technology, but at the same time, it carries the heritage uh, from the first platforms as a service that originate from the early 2000s. So 2006, 2007, the developer community used a service called Heroku and were adopting platform as a service rather than automating virtual machines. So this heritage actually also contained a separation between applications and so-called backing services. So the requirement of 12-factor compliant apps was that they don't have a state stored to them, which opposes a architectural restriction. Not every application can run in a cloud foundry, which creates an obstacle. And a lot of large corporates are sitting on a huge pile, a large number of applications that are not exactly 12-factor compliant. So where to put them? So Kubernetes allows the uh, creation of stateful containers by attaching persistent disks a pattern having an ephemeral VM and a persistent disk that is quite common with virtual machines and also applied uh, in Bosch to orchestrate stateful workloads uh, such as Cloud Foundry itself. So this one is taken to uh, containers and it creates the possibility to deploy those legacy applications without modifying them. A huge advantage over Cloud Foundry while it comes at a price, which means it is less encouraging for developers to develop their application or change existing applications to become stateless, which is generally improving operability. So I would say that uh, Cloud Foundry has a chance. It has a certain, a certain heritage just because it's a bit older. But at the same time, it is solving in its core a similar problem uh, like Kubernetes or the other way around. Kubernetes is solving a similar problem like Cloud Foundry. In particular, Kubernetes is a competitor to the Diego subsystem in Cloud Foundry. So you can take the Cloud Foundry subsystem out and replace it with Kubernetes. And this is exactly what projects in the Cloud Foundry incubation, uh, incubator are doing, uh, to name Project Irini um, in particular, where the idea is you take a Cloud Foundry and you uh, build an interface to a Kubernetes cluster so that you have the Cloud Foundry user experience See of push experience using build packs, but applications will be run in a Kubernetes cluster. So there could be at some point a converging of those technologies, um, but I think it's a bit early to say which one will win the race. It's um, well, definitely Kubernetes has more popularity, but Cloud Foundry has its place. Um, almost not sure yet uh, whether well, Cloud Foundry user experience will go away or will just melt into. Uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem at some point. Yeah, this is uh, something interesting. I mean, and uh, there are two things. Should there be a winner? Can, I mean, I can't 
technologies continue to coexist. But another thing is, uh, this could be off record as well. The Pivotal is now part of VMware, and VMware is investing heavily into Kubernetes. And Pivotal is, you know, one of the you know kind of you know biggest players behind uh, Cloud Foundry as well. So yeah, it's in, it will be interesting to see how things you know work out in the future. Well, that's actually a good point um, because if you look at the vanilla cl- uh, the villa- vanilla Kubernetes, then you have a Kubernetes that has no strong isolation for containers. If you take Kubernetes and let the Kubernetes melt into the hypervisor API, so the virtualization API of VMware, then you could create another class of containers that is well isolated. If you have that well isolation, you can have data service workloads on top of Kubernetes, uh, which is currently not the best idea because of the lack of this isolation. So you have to distinguish then what a combination of Pivotal and Kubernetes can do when Project Pacific, that's the name of the of the project with stateful um, containers, becomes a thing, is different from what the general audience will do if an underlying VMware is not an assumption you can make. So I would say Pivotal has a certain, well, let's say, position to make decisions that are not rec- recommendable at this point in the general audience. If isolated containers become a thing, which I think it it will at some point, then stateful workloads will be uh, put on Kubernetes uh, with absolute advantages. For example, there's many people knowing how to use Kubernetes, and Kubernetes seems to be the next standard on describing distributed workloads. So overcoming this burden uh, or this this, uh, obstacle is something that uh, VMware currently addresses. And uh, let's call it an experiment. Let's see how it works out. And if it works out, I wouldn't be surprised if OpenStack would do something similar, where OpenStack providers seem to now do things on top, like orchestrating virtual machines. But it's not exactly the same thing. You still have those two layers of complexity. The underlying hypothesis of Project Pacific is that having two similar automation layers is wasteful, and therefore the stack should be reduced so that you don't have an arbitrary number of onion skins and only the ones you really, really need. So I understand the hypothesis, but uh, as you've surely seen in the tech space, not always the most meaningful solution becomes the most popular. So we'll have to see how, how this works out. Uh, as long as it's just a VMware thing, I, would call, I wouldn't call it a trend, but I see the potential that this becomes a trend. And if that's the case, we'd also move, uh, we'll also move our data services natively to Kubernetes and offer them under the same license as a response to such a move. But it's a bit early to say, well, now it's the time. So uh, we are we're at the end of 2019, and we'll be soon heading into 2020. Uh, though we cannot talk about you know long term, but in short term, you did touch upon a lot of trends. But what are, what do you what are you excited about or looking forward to for 2020? Because some technologies will mature, or some trends will become you know more popular. Talk about that. Well, service mesh seems in Kubernetes to be um, of high interest. So there are a lot of new projects coming out that do cover various aspects. Um, of that. Traceability uh, was one of them. Locking, monitoring, traffic shaping, all these things are currently very popular and developers need to adapt to that. So I think that's going to be a popular trend. Um, So my personal uh, interest is in data service automation as I um, as this is my main mission so uh, not necessarily this is the most uh, will become the most visible one but it's the one that I'm personally interested in to see how these operators will actually work out in production. Uh, Julian, thank you so much uh, for coming here and talking to us and kind of giving it not only overview, but also actually deep dive into a lot of, you know, uh, because people cannot see behind a lot of, you know, the trends, a lot of hype, but the way you explain things. And that's why I want to talk to you once again. And I actually look forward to talk to you again at some point in the future. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's always a pleasure.